It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Arthur Lee, who's an old friend and uh, not too old, a, a seasoned uh, veteran of the um, international climate negotiations. So Arthur is a uh, Chevron fellow and senior strategy advisor in the corporate strategy and sustainability group at Chevron. Uh, but more uh, relevant to this talk, he is uh, one of the few industry people, in my experience, who actually goes to almost all the climate negotiation uh, meetings, and in addition, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I actually tried doing both for about five years, and I was totally worn out, and he's been doing the same since 1998, which is great. So he is a respected industry spokesman in that group, and there are probably only six or eight of you guys yeah. from <laughs> less than that. Yeah. Remaining. <laughs> Re remaining I I in that uh, realm. Uh, so he's uh, well equipped to talk to us today about what the heck happened at Sharm El Sheikh uh, in Qu COP27 and how the process got to that point and a little bit about where he thinks things will go in the next couple of COPs. I guess we just confirmed that uh, this year's, uh, what's it, November? Uh, in November 30th to is, December 12th. Is in Dubai. So Arthur, yeah. take it away and uh, okay. give us a an overview of uh, all the work you've done. People think these are kind of great places to go and you get to vacation and then shop around and sightsee, but my experience is once you go there, actually a friend of mine described <laughs> the negotiating sessions as 90% boredom and about 2% of totally incredible, outrageous, earth-shattering things, right. either good or bad. So with right. that introduction, take it away, Arthur. Thank you so much, John, for that uh, intro. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I, know, um, I know that, uh, um, that I've been living my life uh, by cop numbers, and I know that sounds very pathetic. You know, it's, uh, I, I've, I've lived my life in, uh, since cop five uh, in 1999, my very first cop, and it was indeed a uh, life-altering event for me. Um, <clears throat> if, if you read my bio, you know I'm a chemical engineer. I came from MIT and then Caltech for my master's. Um, and I thought I'd just work in industry as a chemical process engineer, designing uh, chemical processes, uh, refineries, and uh, as well as even power plant, and also molten carbonate fuel cells and things like that, that, that was early in my, uh, in my repertoire, in my wheelhouse. A chemical, straight ahead chemical engineer. Uh, but when I uh, got to uh, throughout my, then through my career, there have been some twists and turns. And then when I uh, ended up at Texaco, which later became Chevron Texaco and now Chevron, and it's been almost 30 years now. By this April, I'll be, uh, I would have worked uh, 30 years at Chevron or from Texaco onward. Uh, and, I'm a, and I'm a chemical engineer, as I said. I still think of myself as one, uh, even though I haven't practiced chemical engineering in uh, probably over 25 years. Uh, but when I walked in to... Hotel Maritime in Bonn, COP5 in 1999, um, and, and when I left, I was a totally changed person. Um, it really is a life-altering kind of uh, experience um, because, um, you know, being a chemical engineer and then seeing how, how the United Nations actually works was really, uh, uh, well, anyway, I can't use any more superlatives, but it, it just changed my whole outlook on uh, on, on world events and on how, how some things actually work in, in real life. So anyway, um, <clears throat> without uh, too much more, let me just say, uh, say something about, uh, about the COP um, uh, and, and we'll set you all on the same, same page and it will be on this slide that I'll just uh, more or less uh, stay on this slide, okay? Uh, it, is, it really is, uh, is, a, um, uh, is a UN convention, it's called the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So I'll use, I'll use those words first, UNFCCC. Okay, so just remember that. And then the, a COP is actually a conference of parties, parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So a conference of parties, when you hear the word conference, it actually is not the same as like going to a chemistry conference or chemical engineering or electrical engineering conference. You're not there to do business in the traditional sense. You're there to actually negotiate. Um, the nations actually go there as negotiators. They're not there to fool around. They're there to actually negotiate. Um, and so, 
So the UN Framework Convention was uh, agreed to in Rio de Janeiro back in 1992, before my time. Okay? <clears throat> I, I started, like I said, in 1999. So it was before my time, but I could see uh, how it was when, uh, when, it, when they went through uh, um, the, uh, the UNFCCC got, uh, become rat became ratified in 1994, when I think 55 countries uh, acceded or ratified the uh, Framework Convention. Uh, and the United States was actually one of the countries that uh, first ratified it. Um, so, so it is actually law of the land for the United States. Uh, when, when you accede to or you ratify something, in this case, in the U.S. cases uh, by the Senate, you actually make a commitment to the international community that you will pass laws and regulation, whatever your system of governance is, to actually implement that UN Framework Convention. And so that's, uh, that's what, what actually the U.S. EPA did, and, the, and in some ways the U.S. Uh, uh, Energy Information Administration actually did uh, from 1994 onwards. And other countries have done the same. <clears throat> but the UNFCCC was, uh, was a voluntary instrument. So three years later, in COP3, well, COP1 was 1995. Let me just set the record straight. COP1 was Berlin. And, uh, and, and so, uh, like any new process, new meeting, they tried to try to come up with a set of procedures, process uh, procedures, and how to make decisions, okay? So, so uh, let me hold off on that, but the decision-making process itself was a huge debate in, in Berlin and, never, and was never really finalized, okay? You might find that incredible that, uh, that this whole UN thing uh, uh, we're actually operating under draft rules of procedures since uh, 1995. There's nothing final in any of the procedures uh, at the UNFCCC. Everything is draft rules. It's draft rules. But people agree to do it, and so this whole decision-making process is done in a somewhat ad hoc way. I wouldn't say it's completely ad hoc, but it's somewhat in a way that, uh, that at least countries recognize that they're, recon that they're doing things under draft rules of procedures. And the chairman, um, who is usually the facilitator or the, the presidency <coughs> of, the, of the COP, would actually uh, hold up a gavel and actually gavel a decision and say, yes, that's been agreed, and that's it. So that's, that is the process. Okay? When it comes down to it, it is up to the president or the chairman of the COP to gavel a decision and say, yes, that's it, no more, no more discussion, and then it would be decided. That is the, uh, <laughs> that is the ultimate uh, decision making. But of, of course, everything is done by consensus before that. So uh, let me, um, let me uh, give you a sense of uh, COP, uh, uh, the evolution of COP. COP5, as I said, when I uh, went into the Maritime, it changed my life. Uh, it was less than 10,000 people, okay? Uh, and it was just enough, uh, enough attendees and negotiators and observers like me to fill out the room, uh, the rooms and the plenaries and all that at the Hotel Maritime. Now, you might wonder, wow, this hotel must be pretty huge. In fact, it was actually one of the largest hotels uh, and it's the largest hotel in Bonn that can hold these plenaries. It's actually designed almost for the United Nations. So there are these plenary rooms that that could remind you of the United Nations General Assembly in New York. It is quite, quite large. And also three German ministry buildings, I think John's been to some of those, uh, three German ministry buildings that were also uh, borrowed uh, from the Ger German government to be part of the negotiation process as well. So that was it, about 10,000 or maybe even less than 10,000 people. But at COP27, the, the one I'm going to focus on today, it was, I stopped counting at 35,000, okay? Uh, so so it, it's quite different, and the, and the scale of the events are very different. Um, um, so let, let, me, uh, let me go on then. The presidency, this is important to understand, when a, uh, when a president, when a, when a country decides to, to volunteer, really, really to volunteer to be the host country, so that country then automatically accepts the responsibility of also becoming the presidency. So in this case, of course, it was uh, uh, the foreign minister, His Excellency Mr. Same uh, Shukri, the foreign minister of Egypt. So when he became the president, what that means is literally, yes, they also, they, they would announce a city, a host city, 
uh, to host the COP. But it is also his role, his role, he has a very strong role here, to do one thing, okay, and that's uh, one thing only, is to facilitate all of the uh, mediation, bilateral and, and smaller multilateral discussion, especially in the second week of the COP. The, the COP is a two-week process. And the first week is always the technical negotiators. People kind of more or less like me, a technical person, um, are going there to uh, negotiate. And these, of course, these people represent their governments. Uh, I'm just an observer. Okay, so all these negotiators from the government, they negotiate. But then the second week, <clears throat> that's when things get really interesting. And that's when the political level people, the ministers and the assistants, and all of those people, then they wrap up all the uh, technical issues that have been negotiated the first week, if they get uh, any agreements at all. And if they don't, there'll be options and menu of options in those particular issues. And then the political level folks, then they're the ones who make decisions and further massage the package, if you will, and see if they can come to a political agreement of all the decisions that were either made or not quite made, and then they would further make an agreement on that. So, so his role as the president, he would fan out all his, um, his uh, diplomats, the Egyptian diplomats. Their role is simply to mediate and make sure the uh, negotiations are successful. Okay, so, so when you hear, you know, a, uh, like Dubai this year, when you hear something about the presidency of Dubai being, um, <clears throat> being perhaps biased and all that, well, maybe there is some of that. But but you have to understand that the role of the presidency is, is really very purely and simply to make sure the negotiations are successful. Why? Because to have a failure as a host government would actually uh, be quite highly embarrassing for that country. So Egypt, whatever you might have thought of Egypt as a government and, and whatever it is, you know, human rights and all that, Egypt has to, had to look good and had to make sure the negotiations were successful. And so will the UAE. They will have to make sure the negotiations are successful, will be successful. Okay, so, so uh, I just want people to understand that. The, the chairing role, the presidency role, is actually quite pivotal, okay? It's not necessarily something to influence issues, but the way they, they want to influence issues is to influence a successful outcome. Okay. Otherwise, it doesn't look good. And I, and I can, you know, offline, I can even tell you stories at COP, for example, at COP, um, COP, uh, COP 15, in, uh, that was 2009, first year of President Obama's uh, uh, term, presidency. Uh, Copenhagen, uh, the Danish government volunteered to be the presidency, and that was a spectacular failure, unfortunately. And it didn't look good for the Danish government for uh, years after. Okay, so so it's, uh, it's quite unfortunate, but, uh, but it, it does not look good. It did not look good for the Danish government when that whole thing cratered. Okay, so, so let me um, set you uh, on, these, um, on the same page as that. Now, uh, there's something here too. Um, Mr. Shukri, when he, uh, when he talked about the COP in the very first day of the two weeks, he, he called it the implementation COP, that COP27 is time to uh, really stop talking you know, high-level stuff, but talk more about details of uh, implementation. And that's what, uh, that's what the COP turned out to be, lots of details and, and the hashtag that, that, uh, that was given by the organizers and by uh, the presidency was together for implementation. So at the end of it, after two weeks and overtime negotiation, um, he then called this uh, agreement, set of agreement of decisions, he called it the, um, um, uh, the Sharm el-Sheikh implementation plan. Okay? Now this is a bit of a new tradition that, that I'll explain a little bit here. Last year at COP26, the UK government was the presidency, and Mr. Alok Sharma, His Excellency then, he, was the, uh, he had the role of a minister, uh, and he was uh, given uh, the task from the UK government to be the president. And so when after, the, uh, after that was all agreed to and there was a whole set of decisions, the UK government very uh, smartly uh, gave it a name. And the name they gave it was the Glasgow Climate Pact. Okay? 
So I said that with some gravitas, right? Glasgow Climate Pact sounds really important. Okay? Now I'll tell you, it's no, no, it's no more important and certainly not as important as the Paris Agreement or the Kyoto Protocol or the original UN Framework Convention. Just because some government gave it a name doesn't mean that it was that as important. Okay? So I want you to, when you read the, the news media in the future, to really understand what, uh, what uh, sometimes these words and, and names actually mean or don't mean. And, and so, anyway, the UK government is very smart in their portrayal of their success and called it the uh, Glasgow Climate Pact. Sounds really great. Now, uh, actually, the Egyptians were a little bit more down to earth. They just simply called it the Sharm El Sheikh Implementation Plan, which is what it is. It's a lot of implementation patient details. Just, uh, just want you to know the Brits are really good in, uh, in, in, in uh, naming, naming things. Okay? And, uh, and, to, and to tell you why, why the difference was the Paris Agreement is, is a legal instrument. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol that came uh, a few years after the UN Framework Convention was also a legal instrument. And of course, the UNFCCC uh, was, is also a legal instrument. So those, are th so those three are the legal instruments that I'm talking about today. And the, uh, the UNFCCC is really is the legal instrument under which all of these negotiations is the mother treaty, the mother treaty of everything. Uh, and then you have the Kyoto Protocol that came, came in 1997. And then uh, 18 years later, in 2015, we got the Paris Agreement. In between, we had all these decisions, but they're, but they're nowhere as, uh, as, um, as, high, as high level or as important as these legal agreements, okay? Um, all right, so there's a little bit of drama. Uh, I just want to explain these photos. Uh, most of these photos I took, okay? So there's no copyright issues. If you want to use them, I grant you that copyright. <laughs> you could use them, just, just attribute it back to me. And I think these slides will be shared with you. So um, uh, uh, the only one I didn't take is, of course, this one. This one came from the UN. It's based on the webcast. It's a snip of the webcast. But every, I think almost every, every other photo I, uh, in here I, I've taken. Okay, so, so it was a long process, long negotiations. Uh, it lasted uh, almost 70 hours beyond the deadline, which would have been Friday night. But it just went, went right through that. It blasted right through that um, and just had uh, all days negotiations and all night. Okay, when you think about as engineers, some of you, I know, I know I did some all-nighters myself at MIT and Caltech, so you know all-nighters, what that means? Well, these people did all-nighters. Okay, they, these people, people did all-nighters for uh, almost three straight days and night. Okay? Now, I don't know how they slept or whether they took turns going to bed or something, but I'm sure some of them did, uh, and I'm sure some of them didn't. Okay, so it was uh, three straight days of uh, uh, round-the-clock negotiation. And finally, at 3 a.m., um, uh, Mr. Shukri decided, okay, it's time to close the meeting. So he started gaveling all the decisions that have been made up to that time and, and uh, going through the ones that are made. And the ones that are not quite made yet, he, he would do that a little bit later in the morning. And finally, at 6 a.m., it was done. Okay, so from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., they just went through one by one. And there were uh, probably more than 50 issues that they had to that they had to gavel, that he had to gavel down. Okay. So, and he called it the implementation cop. Now this is what uh, one issue looks like in terms of negotiation, and this is actually one of the smaller rooms, okay? It's not one of the bigger rooms, this is one of the smaller rooms. And this, in this room probably there were 25 countries maybe, or a little bit more. Uh, now, now some countries, some representatives in, in this room will actually block, block negotiators, okay? Uh, and let me explain the process of that. Uh, okay, I mean, imagine you were from Vanuatu. Right? You were, you're just one of uh, maybe two, two delegates from Vanuatu. And uh, how would you be able to uh, negotiate 50 issues, 50 decisions? What do you think? Anyone? How would you negotiate 50 issues when there are only two of you? I think I gave you the answer already. You negotiate as a block. You, you go to a block, in this case, um, well, in the, in the case of Vanuatu, they probably go to two blocks. One is called the G77 
plus China is a big negotiating block, group of 77 countries plus China. And or maybe you also go to the small island developing state, SIDS, the SIDS. So that's another block. So you could go to either one or maybe both. And you uh, kind of um, uh, delegate your issues to these block negotiators and let them negotiate whatever it is for you in those 50 issues. And you only focus on the ones that you really care about and you go to those directly. Okay, so a lot of times these smaller countries, that's what they do. Okay, uh, so they go through blocks. Okay, so I just want you to understand that process as well. That's how smaller countries, smaller delegation, uh, dele uh, delegate their part of their sovereignty in a sense uh, to other countries. And uh, that's how they leverage power. Okay. So, so some of the themes that will come through in my presentation is all about power. It's all about power of negotiations and influence on the world stage. The other thing I didn't quite, um, I didn't quite explain, but I'll explain now, is um, in, the, in this UN process, okay? Now, you've always heard of uh, UN General Assembly and all that, right? Uh, and certainly, I grew up in New York City, so, so every time there's a big meeting, you know, you can see traffic uh, go crazy in New York. Uh, um, so so uh, the UN General Assembly and also the UN, uh, you know, when it comes to war and peace process, you, you, have, uh, you have sort of an executive council, right? and that's called the uh, UN Security Council. You have five permanent powers, permanent nuclear powers, and one rotating, uh, rotating state from the General Assembly. And so the five nuclear weapons states are, are basically your executive committee for the world when it comes to uh, war and peace, right? I mean, you still have to vote on certain things. But the UN process is like that at that level and for, for those kind of issues, for war and peace. But in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, it's very different. It's entirely different. Every country has a voice. Every single country has a voice. Okay, I want to let that sink into you. In, in your thinking, okay? You may not have known this, or maybe you were aware of this, but couldn't quite believe it. But every single country has a voice. Now, it doesn't mean that every country has a vote, okay? So uh, there is no voting mechanism in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. No voting. Okay, when that was first proposed back in Berlin, maybe John even knows this uh, and can tell me the process. In, in, uh, in, the, in Berlin, when they tried to, try to propose something like that, a voting procedure for making decisions, guess which countries uh, voted against that? <laughs> guess which countries spoke up against that? Any, anyone? US. US, okay, okay, who else? Anyone else? Okay, I, I won't take too long. European Union, United States, all the big countries, of course, vehemently oppose that, right? Why would they give up their, their right to be a big, powerful country for, to a little country that also has a, have, would have a vote? A G77 plus China will overwhelm any issue, okay, in, in, uh, in a decision-making process like that. Okay, so, so the U US, EU, all the big countries uh, d uh, definitely uh, oppose such a such a voting mechanism. And that, when that was proposed, that basically created a whole uh, decision-making process, um, governance process in, in the first COP. And from then on, 20 plus years later, we're still operating under these draft rules of procedures. We're still under that. And the reason why, you would ask, why would they still be draft? Everyone is still operating under them. But of course, that means, okay, if they're draft, then anytime anyone doesn't really like it, like something happen, they can always say, well, that's a, just a draft. That's just a draft rule. So anyone can actually uh, renege on, on, on following those rules, okay? which is why you need a strong presidency to gavel a decision and say, okay, that's been made. Okay, so, so we're operating in this UN Framework Convention, which I didn't know until, until a few years into the COP myself. I didn't, really didn't understand this. But a few years into the COP, I finally realized, wow, the, the power structure, the, the power influence. And, and again, I'm a chemical engineer, you know, I don't know political science, but this was amazing to me, okay, how, how all this works, okay? So anyway, so as an engineer, scientist, you know, I found this fascinating, you know, just observing all this. It's, uh, it's been life-altering. Life okay, so, so in, uh, in this, um, 
Um, and I'll just give you five key takeaways from the Sharm El Sheikh implementation plan from what was agreed to in COP27. And with these five, I can tell you a little, a little stories with each because I, th I hope you will find it interesting and it will illustrate some of the realities of what actually happens at these negotiations. Number one, the Paris Agreement goals, although the Paris Agreement goals are clearly restated and reinforced at, the, at this COP, um, uh, but there, there is some statement, there is some emphasis shifting more towards the goal of one and a half degrees. Okay? Now, sh uh, now, of course, the uh, Paris Agreement, if you recall, is all about well below two degrees, right? And with actions, steps taken towards no more than one and a half degrees. Okay? So, so that's the, uh, well, I didn't quote it ver verbatim, but that's uh, essentially the, uh, the decision made at the uh, Paris Agreement at COP21. Okay, so again, note down that number, COP21. That's the Paris Agreement. Okay, so at COP27 now, um, there's that restatement of purpose, restatement of the goal. But the de there definitely is now more of an emphasis towards one and a half degrees because the scientific community really thinks that, that uh, even getting to one and a half degrees, would, there would still be a lot of impact, you know, a significant adverse impact on on uh, on us on human beings okay so so one and a half degrees definitely uh, there's that switch on emphasis but one of the parties and and i'm not and i'm not making any of this up you can watch the uh, the plenary at the at the end of the final hours and you know here in california whatever it was uh, um, and then uh, 3 a.m in the morning over there uh, you can you can hear switzerland the swiss representative talking on behalf of his block, his block was called the Environmental Integrity Group, which consists of about five or six countries. Um, so the Swiss representative spoke up and said, well, you know, I, I just uh, found, uh, he, he said something really, not too outrageous, but he said he, he was very disappointed that some countries, some parties, uh, which shall remain unnamed, and that's what he said, and he didn't name them, uh, uh, tried to roll back what was already agreed to at Glasgow. COP26, okay? So I'll connect the dots for you, and I'm not saying that necessarily that's what happened because I wasn't there. I wasn't there in the closed rooms when they were negotiating this. But um, in COP26, there were two, two of the most controversial statements were made was about uh, phasing out of coal, okay? And phasing out of fossil fuel subsidies. Now, just be fully transparent. You know, of course, I come from Chevron. I'm, I work for a uh, oil and gas company. So, so those two were the first were proposed as, as words in the decision at COP26, phase out, okay, phase out of uh, coal and phase out of fossil fuel subsidies. But what happened was uh, the, the, um, the, uh, uh, they were at the very end, at COP26, the president, that was Alok Sharma, a British uh, minister, uh, he, uh, he basically when he saw, uh, he was about to gavel the decision, when he saw China, raises placard and press the button to say that they want to speak and they and he had to recognize them he wasn't fast enough with the gavel uh, and, they, and and they spoke up and they said that uh, uh, we oppose we oppose this uh, use of the words phase out of coal okay and and then and also the the other countries like india also spoke up and several others as well spoke up opposed the words phase out of coal and uh, so they the counter proposal was we prefer phase down of coal. Now, of course, you know the difference between English words phase down and phase out, right? Right? I mean, is it clear to you what, what the difference is? Phase down, which is what China now got, versus phase out, right? Phase out, of course, means zero. Phase down means decline, but it never said it could be zero, right? So, so India supported that as well. Now. The compromise that then and, and now I'm, I'm talk, talking about COP26 now. So uh, so Alex Sharma was very pained. You could see the UN camera was focused on him, and I, I was able to watch this. Uh, I was already back home, but I was I watched it and I thought, oh my goodness, you know, he could he's seeing the whole thing unravel before him, in front of him. He, he could see the whole thing unraveling, and he was very pained looking. Um, so. Uh, so he suspended the plenary meeting at that point, suspended it, and started walking around and started getting people together. Uh, and it was John Kerry, our, our special envoy, 
Uh, John Kerry has a role of special envoy, so, so on the climate change issue, he has the same role, same level of uh, a protocol as uh, Anthony Blinken, uh, Secretary of State. Okay, just, just want to give you a little bit of that diplomatic nicety. So he would report to the president uh, in the cabinet with that role uh, equal to Anthony Blinken. Anyway, so uh, John Kerry started walking around uh, because he was, of course, very concerned about this too. And so he, uh, he uh, talked to the, uh, the Chinese um, lead negotiator, his, his counterpart, uh, and he went around. Um, now, it's funny that he didn't, he didn't stop at the EU uh, delegation. He did not stop. Uh, later on, when the EU said, uh, uh, we, 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 we buy into the compromise, but we are disappointed that we were not consulted. So you could see exactly why the EU person said that, because, because the U.S. person, John Kerry, never consulted them. Uh, so it was, it was funny that how, how these, um, how we're all human beings, and, you know, she wasn't consulted, so she, she really, uh, really let, let John Kerry have it. Uh, it's funny when, when I see these things. Um, so, so uh, yeah, so, so the final compromise, as I said, was phase down of coal uh, of use, but, uh, but phase out of fossil fuel subsidies, okay? So India didn't get everything it wanted, and, and neither did China. But, uh, but anyway, uh, so, so that particular agreement was almost rolled back at this COP, at COP27. Okay? So, that, so that I'm connecting the dots for you. Of course, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that China and India said those things. Uh, in the closed door session, but uh, but I have a very strong feeling that that's uh, what happened. Okay, so number two, the mitigation work program to enhance uh, nationally determined contribution by some parties still needs to be completely fleshed out in 23 and 24. Okay, 2023 and 24. Now, uh, here here I will also share with you a little bit uh, of a, a decoding kind of exercise, uh, how to read UN language. Okay. Uh, a mitigation work program, that sounds nice. Okay? Um, it's actually, when you have a work program in a UN decision, it actually means that the countries uh, did not agree. They did not agree. But what they agreed to was to disagree, and, uh, and so for the next two years, they will work on it. So that is the work program. So whenever you see that in the UN framework convention decision, you know that, uh, that the countries actually didn't agree, but they agreed to uh, continue working. Which is, which is nice, okay, which is still good. So they will continue to work. Um, and, and they even have uh, some words, further words in there to say what they will work on. Uh, and they will have uh, some workshops, okay, some workshops uh, to be negotiated uh, in 23 and 24. Okay? So, so just note down those words in your future when you, uh, when you see work program in the UN context, you know something, what, you know exactly what that means, okay. Okay, uh, number three was actually the biggest uh, headline-grabbing um, agreement uh, out of the, out of the uh, implementation plan, the, Sh the Sharm el-Sheikh implementation plan. Now, I'll give you a bit of context here, okay? This new loss and damage financial facility has been set, okay? But there's no money in it, okay? And I'll explain what that means. In the UN Framework Convention for the longest time uh, since, uh, since 1994, okay? Uh, there's been money for, there's, there, there's two buckets of money um, uh, historically. There's been the bucket of money for, uh, for mitigation. That is the, uh, the, the word for reducing emissions. So that, that is the first bucket of money, and, it, and it's represented through the Global Environment Facility, or GEF, which is it's actually stewarded by the World Bank. Okay, so the World Bank actually has a lot of authority and a lot of influence over many of these uh, uh, funds of money. Okay. So it's for reducing emissions. And countries have to apply more or less to the World Bank as the, as the uh, dispenser of this money to get that money. Okay. So that's one bucket of money. And then there's a second bucket of money for climate change adaptation. And that is more or less represented through the Adaptation Fund, which was uh, uh, established a little bit later in the history of the UNSCCC. So there's money for that. And some of that money can, comes from directly from the... Uh, What's in the Kyoto Protocol come, coming from the uh, uh, what's called the uh, uh, Clean Development Mechanism. So there's like a 2%, uh, almost like a tax, 2% tax on the proceeds of the Clean Development Mechanism, which, 
which I, I won't go into too much details, is about doing projects in a developing country, and then you do, and those emission reduction can be turned into credits. And those credits, you take 2% of that, sell on the market, and you, uh, you can put those funds into this adaptation fund. So there's that second bucket of money on climate change adaptation. Okay? Now the third bucket of money has never been talked about, but, but uh, if you think of it this way, um, I, I always try to use um, very practical, everyday examples. Okay, you try to reduce emissions, and then you do a lot to adapt uh, your country, your infrastructure to uh, these future impacts. But if you still get extreme events and you get, uh, you get you know, problems, uh, what happens? Okay? Um, so, uh, so your country is damaged, right? Uh, so what happens? Where, where do you turn to, uh, to help your country to, uh, to, uh, to recover? I mean, of course, I'm not equating what's happening in Turkey now, but, but imagine, imagine this third bucket of money. That's what this was for, is to think about loss and damage, because there's never been this third bucket of money uh, beyond the mitigation and beyond the adaptation. So, so since, I'll give you another story, since 2000, um, um, 2013, at COP19 in Warsaw, Okay. COP19 in Warsaw was the first time actually in my memory when countries actually came up with something called the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage. And there's no money in that either. But let me give you a story on that. Okay. Um, a quick story on that is the first week of, uh, of COP19, remember COP21 was two years in the future. COP19 is Warsaw. The lead negotiator, a, a technical negotiator, uh, the lead uh, negotiator is Mr. Um, Mr. Uh, 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 Sanarev, uh, sorry, uh, um, uh, uh, Danarev Sano, okay, uh, that's his name. Uh, and his, when he stood up, uh, or when he uh, raised his flag in the first plenary, he said that, um, you know, uh, the week before, um, Super Typhoon Haiyan, Super Typhoon Haiyan struck the Philippines, the east coast of the Philippines, with a lot of this devastating force and basically destroyed half of the city of Cebu. Okay, the Cebu city was uh, destroyed, uh, half of it. And, uh, and, and he's basically said in that first plenary, first, first intervention, that he said he was, um, um, that he had family members who were uh, injured and or killed. And I remember, I, th I, I remember there were deaths in his family. So the next few, uh, next few minutes later, he, he talked about he would go on hunger strike, which he did uh, for about five, six days. Okay? And because of that, there were a lot of people in the observers community who uh, were uh, very sympathetic to what he was going through. And they, too, went on hunger strike with him okay, for several days. Okay? So, so that, that at COP... 19, that set of negotiations was very emotional and very, uh, um, I, I guess what he did was very impactful. And so at the end of it, um, they finally, all the countries, after years of opposition, all the countries decided that, yes, they will have a Warsaw International Mechanism on Loss and Damage. Now, uh, the countries that oppose this um, uh, loss and damage were mainly, again, um, if you, you can make a guess who, who, which countries were opposed to this. Any good guess? Any guess? Same as last time. Same as last time, yeah. It, more or less, that's right. Uh, because, uh, um, because we as a country, the United States, and our European uh, allies argued that uh, we should not be held accountable, liable, legal liabilities for any of this, for any... Uh, uh, hurricanes or anything. Okay, we, we're not liable because the science is not saying that uh, we're liable. Okay, so so the uh, so the large countries basically have said no, no way. Um, we're not going to give any. Uh, so first of all, we're not going to give any money, and, and most important, no legal liability, so that uh, no other country can take U.S. or EU to court, okay, to the international court. So so the legal liability question uh, now is still there, okay, but. I think the only reason why the EU and the United States this time at COP27 agreed 
was because I think that legal liability question is still off the table, but countries now are willing to talk money. Okay? They're willing to talk money, but not because of liability, but because of a kind of a voluntary nature of that money, to, to put money into a fund. So this fund, um, is, there's no fund yet. Uh, there is uh, something called a transitional committee. It is being operationalized this year, and they will uh, start thinking about all the criteria and processes of what this fund could do. Now, what do you think the, the, the what do you think the, the things that they need the most in terms of setting up this fund? Well, uh, I mean, I'll tell you. The the uh, just like just think of it like um, like your insurance company. Okay, I mean that's how I think about it. Think of it like your insurance company. You know, if, if there's been damage to your car, your house, whatever, um, uh, you have to make a claim, right? So what is the, uh, the claim process for all this? And what are the criteria for this claim process? And then, and then of course, if, if that claim is satisfied, then, then uh, what would happen uh, to dispense the money? How do you actually get the money and how much and how frequent? You know, that, all of that needs to be operationalized. So in the UN, uh, you will see these kind of negotiations for the next uh, two years, probably two years, to get that operationalized. So watch for this. There will be more to come on this money. Right now, there's no money. Like I said, it's just a box, empty box, no money. But all these procedures and criteria have to be operationalized too. Okay? So it's not just simply getting the money. Okay? All right, number four is also about money. A new collective quantified goal still needs to be negotiated in 2023, and, and, the, and, uh, and these negotiations have to end in 2025, uh, in 2024. Our reason for this is fairly straightforward. Again, uh, at COP21, uh, which is 2015, that year, the negotiations were also very fraught, very much fraught. Countries were pushing the wealthier countries to come up with uh, money that will help the lesser developed countries to reduce emissions and or to to adapt uh, to uh, climate change. Okay, so 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 the Paris Agreement, if you have to understand the Paris Agreement, at the heart of it, okay, is really a voluntary agreement. Okay, we're back to the UNFCCC. I didn't even go through the Kyoto Protocol. The Kyoto Protocol is actually a mandatory agreement for some countries, so that didn't work. So the Paris Agreement. Um, uh, years later became another voluntary agreement and all countries can volunteer to do what they can uh, and these are called uh, nationally determined contributions or those of us in the community call, just call them NDCs. And these developing countries, almost all of them have NDC that's unconditional. That means they will of course do something without any conditions. And then, and then there are NDCs where they will accept money, in fact, they need money, to help them reduce emissions or adapt to climate change impact. Those are the conditional NDCs. So if you count up all the NDCs that are conditional and there's a certain amount of money that would be attached to it, you can actually arrive at a, a new goal for, uh, for, uh, for assistance, for financial assistance. So that's, some, what's, that's what some analysts have done. And that number could be anywhere uh, in terms of, um, well, I didn't even give you the old number. The old number was $100 billion a year. $100 billion a year for the period 2020 to 2025. Now, your next question would probably ask, okay, has that ever been done? Has that ever been achieved? And my simple answer is no. Um, no country has ever, uh, not, uh, there's been no, not enough money contributed at all to that, uh, to that $100 billion per year goal. Okay, the closest that they got to was uh, like 90 billion in one year. And, and that's it, there was nothing cumulative about it. 90 billion and in, that, in, the, in the last several years. Okay, so, so this goal has never been achieved, but the Paris Agreement actually stipulates that you must now negotiate for the period uh, 20, beyond 2025. You must have a new goal, and the stipulation is that that new goal, quantified goal, must be higher than the $100 billion per year, okay? So, um, so this will be fraught. Uh, negotiation will be fraught starting uh, this year in Dubai. Okay, whenever countries talk about money, they always drift very far apart and, and don't converge. 
And so the $300 billion is like the least amount that some analysts have found. But the high end, the high end is, uh, uh, it probably doesn't astonish me anymore, but the high end of it is, uh, is about uh, uh, five and a half trillion per year. Okay, not a cumulative number, but five and a half trillion per year. Okay, so I'll let that sink in as well. So how do you think, um, how do you think these negotiations go in, uh, in Dubai? It's fraught. Okay, so that's my, uh, my, my conclusion. Um, so between countries, it's going to be, whenever they talk about money, uh, very hard to see them come together. Okay? okay, Article 6 is more or less about cooperative approaches. It's about countries uh, getting together and actually cooperate in terms of maybe uh, emissions trading. So, so two or more countries could, under Article 6, Paragraph 2, could decide that uh, two or more countries could cap their total emissions at some level, and then they could actually trade emissions by reducing more than what the cap says. And so by doing that, they can then trade the excess emission uh, credits or reductions as, as credits amongst each other. And that way, they can um, um, look for the countries with the most cost-effective uh, emission reduction and still be able to reduce emissions overall for a, a club or group of countries. So that's under Article 6, Paragraph 2 uh, of the Paris Agreement. And Article 6, Paragraph 2 procedures have been very well spelled out now. Um, at COP27, it, was, it received a lot more negotiation time, and uh, there was a lot of detailed agreement. Uh, 6.4, Paragraph 4, uh, is a lot slower. And that is uh, a kind of agreement like the old clean development mechanism. It's a much more UN-focused, a UN-centered uh, um, agreement where a U the United Nations would actually set up a uh, supervisory body to actually approve projects uh, to be done in certain countries, and the emission credits would then flow from, from those actions. So those procedures, uh, even though there are more details now in COP27, there's still more details that need to be done. And so many of us expect 6.4 to be a lot slower coming out of the gate. 6.2 is ready. And there are lots of countries now uh, doing bilateral um, agreements already. They haven't traded yet. But, they, but the countries like Singapore, Switzerland, uh, together with seven and eight other uh, developing countries are starting to write uh, bilateral agreements. Okay. But 6.4 is a lot slower. Okay, and, and I'll say one other quick thing. Article 6 uh, uh, had the title of Cooperative Approaches um, uh, uh, in the run-up to the Paris Agreement. But, and yet, um, it failed to uh, uh, complete negotiations at COP24, 25, and then the pandemic year when everything was skipped, and then 26 finally it achieved agreement. So the, 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 the one provision in the... In the Paris Agreement that was supposed to be uh, enhanced cooperation actually had the least, the least cooperation between countries. So it, uh, it was kind of disappointing. Okay, um, okay. I, I won't go into any more of this, but uh, uh, this is the Sharm el-Sheikh implementation plan. Uh, actually, there are 17 chapters, There's, and I only cover those that I highlighted. And I didn't even do justice to uh, any single one of them, except for a few, uh, few examples. Okay, so um, I just want to show you, um, well, I, I spoke in the IPCC uh, pavilion, the science pavilion, uh, talking about uh, carbon capture and geologic storage uh, for industry. I talked about that. Uh, now, I want to focus on this one uh, because this is, I'm at Stanford now. I'm with, uh, with students and, and uh, many people who could be in the youth NGO community, the youth, the, uh, the youth movement. Okay? Now, uh, another the part of the UN process you might find very interesting is uh, I'm with a business community, so my constituency is called BINGO, Business Industry NGO. So uh, a lot of people call me a bingo. Bingo, okay? Uh, uh, environmental NGOs are ENGO, ENGOs, okay? Uh, gender NGO for women and other gender issues would be just gender NGO. And of course, uh, youth movement is young goes, 
Okay, so I know I make that sound a little funny, but but that's what that's what that's how the UN look at us. Okay, by the way, UN look at us as 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 uh, uh, not companies, but as constitu constituencies. Okay, UN does not look at uh, Sierra Club as one entity. UN, UN look at the uh, the whole NGO uh, ENGO as one big constituency. So I'm in one big constituency. The young goes. This is the young goes. Okay, uh, for the first time, uh, obtained funding, and it was on a part of the UN and and several countries, donor countries, decided that that we must allow the youth movement to have a strong voice. And so a pavilion was set up so that the youth movement could invite people to talk and actually uh, think about and give input to the negotiation process. Now the reason for this, uh, and I'll give you a very practical reason. In, at COP24 and COP25, the, the youth movement's messaging to the UN, um, at both at the official level and also in terms of demonstration and protest, became louder and louder and angrier and angrier in both, uh, in both uh, circumstances. Okay? At COP25 in Madrid, in fact, uh, there were like over 300 uh, people who, um, who staged a, a very disruptive demonstration uh, at one of the negotiating track, one of the uh, negotiating rooms, and disrupted that whole negotiation for hours. Okay, so now that didn't do anyone any good because that simply delayed the process, um, and and so uh, and those th those three hundred uh, 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 youngo uh, members were ejected from the uh, arrested by the uh, UN police, and these are real police by the way. The, the UN in the blue zone, the UN actually they have police powers and they actually carry weapons. So uh, so they are real police, and they ejected three hundred. Uh, youth movement um, people and and debadged them as well. Took away their badges so that they could not come back. Now whether they were permanently debadged, I don't know, but uh, it's possible. Okay, because they were very disruptive. Okay, but anyway, so so having a young go for the first time, a young go pavilion, doing very uh, systematic and lots of side events, I think was very helpful. Much more helpful than before when when there was uh, no voice given to the youth. And children and youth um, uh, voice. Okay, all right. So uh, let me just show you um, uh, some more pictures. Now, these are the actual words from a decision package on the right hand side. So, and, and I'm just quoting, you know, just a few paragraphs in each. Each of this, these decisions are pages long, you know, four, five, six pages long. Okay, so uh, so uh, so there are lots of these decisions that were made, and I just show you the uh, the actual negotiation itself. Is, uh, is like this, okay? This is a little bit bigger room than what I showed you earlier. This one was uh, probably on, on uh, tech, uh, this one was probably not on technology, but on the uh, new, uh, um, new collective quantified goal, the money, the money issue, which of course attracted a lot of the negotiators. Okay? So this was a big negotiation. Um, and this too was a technical negotiation, but it was held in the first week, it was a plenary, Held by the chair of Substa Mapanu Mapanu, of uh, uh, of uh, 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 one of the West African countries. Sorry, I've forgotten. But uh, Mapanu Mapanu was the chair. Okay, and so this was a uh, technology negotiation, and you can see that uh, that's what people actually do. They actually negotiate for hours over words, and you can see the upper left corner there, the words there. Um, and you know, in this particular case, it's very close to final. Okay, so there were no brackets. So when there are still disagreement, the text itself would be bracketed, and there could be options. Sometimes option in the text, and that's exactly what happened in the. Let me show you, in this particular slide. Okay, on on this slide, this is about technology, about technology transfer and development. Okay, and on this particular slide, uh, the U.S. negotiator, Mr. Irwin Rose. Uh, he was looking very. Oops, he was looking very intently, intently on the screen, and so is his counterpart in the EU. Uh, that woman there in the EU, from the EU, they were allies on this issue, and so when Argentina uh, off screen, when Argentina spoke up and inserted a few words on what they had proposed for this decision, they were intently looking at it and seeing whether it could impact uh, how 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 it could be, uh, how it be handled in the future. 
So I think eventually, this was at the end of, uh, of the final hour of the final session, uh, they had to make a choice. Uh, and they could either delete the whole paragraph or they could go with a compromise. So I think that for this particular issue, they, they went with a compromise. But if it's a bracketed text and there are all these brackets and you can't take away the brackets, that's bad news. That means uh, very likely then, uh, that you need to remove the whole paragraph. That's why sometimes these decisions, they don't read very well. They, they read very choppily, like very choppy. But this was the, uh, the chair. Uh, uh, she's from Austria, and she, uh, she basically threatened uh, people, say, you know, if you don't come to some compromise, I'm going to uh, Im invoke draft rule 16. <laughs> and again, I, I, to I told you what draft rules mean. But draft rule 16 would have deleted everything that went on that whole session, OK, the, the whole two weeks. Delete everything and the whole year before. So, so you would come back to this decision again next time, literally with a white sheet of paper. Okay? So, so I'll just end there. I know I took a long time, but I hope you found it um, interesting um, because that's what really happens at these meetings. Okay? It's, not, it's not pretty, okay? but it is necessary. Uh, and I'll say that again. It's not pretty, but it's necessary. Everyone has a voice. Everyone. Every single country has a voice. No voting, but every single country has a voice. There's no executive committee to make decisions for you or for the world. There's no uh, security council for climate change. Okay? Every single country has a voice. And that's why these, these, these cops are like this. And it's done every year so that this progress is slow, but it's made. Okay? So I hope I've convinced you it's... Uh, it's not a pretty process, but it's necessary. Thank you. Thanks very much, Arthur.